I feel horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I had my my second shot yesterday, um, so that the interpreter has some context. Um, uh, my second vaccine, but I loaded up on caffeine and ibuprofen like 30 minutes ago, so I'm gonna make it through this next hour. <laughs> yes. All, All right. right. I feel like we're pretty good to get started. Um, yeah. So, all right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Today, we're going to be talking about understanding fair housing during COVID-19. So we're going to get into a couple of topics, uh, protected classes that have had a unique impact during COVID-19 and how, as service providers, you can uh, support those uh, populations and have a better understanding of what fair housing should mean uh, to everyone who's involved in housing in our you know, greater Pittsburgh area. So hopefully everyone can see my screen and everyone can hear me okay. If that's not the case at any point, uh, put, you can put it in the Q&A um, or you can put it in the chat and let us know. Uh, right now I'm going to, um, I'm gonna put a pin on the interpreter. Actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, spotlight the interpreter uh, while we're in the presentation mode that will allow for the interpreters to stay seen while we're doing this presentation. So this is a little slide about you, um, making sure you're in the right place. If you're a human services, social services provider, if you provide housing or if you work with a population that has an elevated need for housing, uh, if you're curious about your rights and responsibilities, as well as the rights and responsibilities of the people that you serve, and if you're committed to human rights, then you should probably know about fair housing as it relates to you as a service provider in the greater Pittsburgh area. What we're going to be talking about today are some new issues and access for uh, people with disabilities, barriers for people with uh, barriers to housing for people with complex or diverse needs, ways to increase access to your programs to diverse populations and answers to your questions. So there's going to be an, a question answer section at the end of this, and uh, you'll be free to ask uh, members of our panel. Who do we have here with us? So um, I'm from the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations. I may have forgotten to introduce myself. My name is Jam Hammond. Also from the commission, we have one of our investigators, Emily Costello. From Fair Housing Partnership, we have Megan Hammond Comfer, and then from the uh, Global Wordsmiths, we have Mary Jane uh, McCullough. So thank you to both of you for, for coming to talk to us today, and we'll uh, get right into it. So I'm going to pass it over to, uh, to Emily for her to give us a little bit of an overview of the commission. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, we investigate complaints of discrimination for housing, employment, public accommodations, and um, city services um, cases. Um, and we, we go based on your status in one or more protected class. That's how you're able to file with us. Um, some of our guidelines are that the harm that you experienced um, must have occurred within the past year and within city boundaries. Um, if it's not a complaint that we can take, uh, the PA commission can take your complaint. Um, they're kind of the overarching entity. Um, and we also provide outreach and education on fair housing and employment practices for anyone that wants to learn or as an employer or, um, you know, landlord themselves. Um, just a little bit about protected class. Um, a protected class is a collection of identities that share a common category and are protected against discrimination under the law. Um, so some examples are race, sex, disability, um, status as, as a survivor of domestic violence. Um, we cover seven within the Fair Housing Act and then um, eight within our Pittsburgh city code. Um, some of them, most of them overlap, um, but those are the ones that we cover and the ones that you're able to file under with our office. Um, and yeah, these, these are often in, unalienable. Sorry, Jam. <laughs> um, oh yeah, so here are the, here are the classes. Um, the seven that are under the Federal Fair Housing Act um, are on the left, and then the ones that we cover are on the right. Um, and like I said, most of them overlap. 
Um, so some examples, we wanted to provide some examples of things that are legal practices um, in housing. So they're listed here. I won't go through all of them, but I think it's important to provide examples of at least a couple. Um, so um, terms and conditions is one of them. Um, set different terms and conditions or privileges for sale or rental. If you are um, a refugee or an immigrant and you go to try to rent an apartment and the landlord says, you know, because English isn't your first language or because, you know, um, you're an immigrant or a refugee, you have to pay twice the security deposit um, or, or they don't even say that to you and they just charge you twice the security deposit and then you later find out that's an illegal practice. That's something that, you know, we cover. Um, another a different example of this uh, would be so of falsely deny housing that's available. An example of that would be if, um, you know, you or your partner are pregnant and you call about um, an apartment, you'd like to come visit it, you'd like to come view it. Um, and, you know, the, the landlord says, yes, it's available, you know, you set up a time to come. And then upon showing up, um, the landlord sees that you or your partner is pregnant and they might say, oh, um, you know, unfortunately the house was just taken by the people that came in, you know, right before you. Um, and, and that they're saying, you know, they don't want someone with children in the apartment or, or whatever they're assuming that um, situation. That's also illegal. Um, there's many different examples of things. Um, I, I don't want to go through all of them, but um, if you ever have questions about something that has happened to you um, personally, always, always, always give us a call and we can at least tell you if we can't help you, we can give you someone that get you to someone that can. Yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about exemptions to the Fair Housing Act. There are some exemptions to the Fair Housing Act. There are three major ones uh, that we would talk about. Um, small landlords that live in their property. Um, this is also called Mrs. Murphy's exemption. In the state of Pennsylvania, um, it only applies to duplexes. So the Fair Housing Act will say uh, if, the, if the building is four units or less, the uh, PA Human Relations Act says if the building is two units or less. Um, so if that landlord is living in the, in the unit, they may be exempt uh, from the Fair Housing Act. Certain religious organizations and um, and clubs might be able to have exemptions if they're providing housing for people um, inside that organization. And then there is a familial status exemption for housing that's meant for seniors, that's receiving um, funding specifically for seniors. Um, two exemptions to the exemptions. So race is, is a protected class that uh, can have no exemption when it comes to the Fair Housing Act. Uh, that's because there's a predated uh, a, a civil rights act that predates the Fair Housing Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and it prohibits discrimination on the basis of race. So no person is exempt from that first Civil Rights Act and uh, race, if the discrimination is based on race, it won't be eligible for any of these exemptions to the Fair Housing Act. Um, there are also no exemptions to Pittsburgh City Code. So as en Emily mentioned earlier, Pittsburgh City Code mirrors the Fair Housing Act and the protected classes that it has and adds eight more. So even if you can't file under the Fair Housing Act, you can still file with the city of Pittsburgh and there are no exemptions under our uh, Fair, Housing, uh, Fair Housing Ordinance. I'm just going to give a little bit of a definition of disability. Any of the definitions that uh, I give are to give us an understanding of what we could mean when we say this, this protected class, but obviously they are also identities. So each person might define their identity differently. So I would, I would say, you know, don't allow the definition to stop you from attempting to file. Always come and ask, you know, could I be covered? But typically speaking, a disability is a physical or mental condition that substantially limits or changes major activities of a person's life. Remember that it's physical and mental conditions. So that's one of the major things that we want people to know during this Fair Housing Month is that, you know, there are disabilities that cannot necessarily be seen at all times. They're still protected under the Fair Housing Act and under Pittsburgh's Fair Housing Ordinance. Here we're going to talk a little bit about um, about COVID-19 and disability protections. I'm going to turn it over to Megan to kind of give a little bit more detail. Thanks, Jan. Uh, so to go through the concept of disability in the Fair Housing Act and to backtrack for a minute, 
you know, please understand and, and remember that the Fair Housing Act was passed on April 11th, 1968 as a direct result of the brutal assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so the civil rights laws that we have aren't by default, it took blood and sweat and tears in order to achieve these laws. And what we are grateful and fortunate to have in the city of Pittsburgh are additional protections on top of what the federal government provides. So especially as service providers to vulnerable populations and recognizing disability, recognize that disability on a federal level is based on the definition and the allowance of HIV and AIDS status to be included within the definition of disability. Because remember, disability was passed in 1988 as a protected class, right in the middle of the awful HIV AIDS epidemic that we went through as a country and continues today. And so what that means today with COVID-19 is that a, a, a disease or an infectious disease or concepts of contagion is absolutely covered under the Fair Housing Act as a disability. And so when we consider disability, disability and all the protected classes include a perception. And so it doesn't matter actually if you are a member of a certain protected class, if you are perceived to be and treated that way because of a perception, then you have been discriminated against even when that's not your identity. And so when we look at perception in COVID-19, what we're concerned about are housing providers perceiving tenants to have an exposure to COVID-19 or to be associated with COVID-19 and then to have an act of harm. So to deny housing, to evict, to require additional deposits or additional rules. And when we look at COVID-19, we're thinking about healthcare staff doctors and nurses and janitors and other service providers, anyone who's working within hospitals and medical uh, properties and buildings. And also, we recognize that assisted living locations and nursing homes have had outbreaks of COVID-19, but it shouldn't stop a housing provider from accepting a tenant who's relocating from those properties. And so there's a difference between the perception and then the actual identification that if a person does have COVID-19, what is science and fact-based ways to ensure that they can safely relocate into a property? How can we look at a quarantine, uh, at negative tests, at ways to access people, how to access people to housing safely? And so when we're considering COVID-19 and disability, it's important to understand how COVID-19 relates back uh, to the act of harm and that a person doesn't have to actively have COVID-19 if they're being treated wrongly in housing because of that perception and an identification, even if that identification isn't true. Next slide. And so to touch on is to understand within disability is to understand reasonable accommodations. So a reasonable accommodation is a change to the rule for a person with a disability. And so recognize is that the Fair Housing Act means that all tenants must be created equally. Within reasonable accommodations are additional duties related to disability that gives equitable access. It gives people with disabilities the same access to housing as people who don't have disabilities. And so reasonable accommodations that we're seeing with COVID-19, for example, is we had a housing provider who required that all of the caregivers entering the property uh, required a vaccination. Now vaccinations are becoming easier to come by and hopefully everyone can be vaccinated shortly but we can't guarantee any vaccination at this time. And the tenant with the disability was threatened with losing their in-home caregiver because the organization did not have a caregiver uh, who was vaccinated. And so the reasonable accommodation process allows for ensuring that in safe and healthy ways that people with disabilities have the same access 
the housing by having a change to the rule for that individual person by allowing in caregivers, you know, despite the rule that people coming into the property who weren't tenants were required to be vaccinated. So recognized with reasonable accommodations is that a housing provider cannot simply say no. Once we meet the required nexus, and, and that nexus is the person has a disability, the disability related request is related back to the disability symptoms. Once we reach that threshold, the housing provider should engage in an interactive process. And what that process means is it's not a statement of no, but if the direct request can't be met, then what are other alternatives that can be done in order to make a, a to allow the request? And when we're looking at the interactive process, it's important to understand what verification is. And so for reasonable accommodation is that the landlord does have a right to request third party verification. And that third party verification is required when the disability and the disability related need is not obvious. And so what I mean by obvious is that it's a person is a wheelchair user and they're asking for wide end doorways in the unit, then that request is a person using a wheelchair, the wheelchair is too wide to safely go through the doors. And so the disability and the request are clearly connected. But if a person using a wheelchair has an emotional support cat, then the mental health symptoms that require an emotional support cat, uh, such as uh, help with racing thoughts, assistance with regulating emotions, that companionship to address isolation, then the disability related need is not readily identifiable. You can't observe it. And so third party verification is appropriate. Now what that is, and the reason why it's called third party, is because it doesn't have to come from a doctor or a medical professional. Third party is written to be intentionally vague. And what that vagueness means is that it's anybody who provides supports or treatment or services for that person with a disability who is familiar with that person's needs. And what that document simply needs to say is that the person has a disability, which is a substantial impact to one or more major life activities, which we all understand is eating, sleeping, hearing, walking, uh, regulating emotions, maintaining a day-to-day -day schedule. There's such a wide variety of what is a major life activity. So a statement of disability, it doesn't have to say diagnosis, what the symptoms of that disability are, and then how the symptoms and the request relate to each other. And that's what the verification needs to say. What everyone needs to be aware of and what we'll touch on about reasonable accommodations and emotional support animals is understand that the Fair Housing Act is the last remaining law that allows for emotional support animals. And they are absolutely allowed in your home. And so what has happened has been a industry has built up in which you can engage with an online provider for a single or a couple of times interaction, pay a fee, and obtain a third party verification letter. Now, under COVID-19, we have all understood that telehealth is acceptable, widely used now, and absolutely legitimate treatment. However, telehealth and online third party providers, especially for emotional support animals, are not the same thing. I implore you to tell your clients not to use online third party providers, particularly for emotional support animals. The, request, the letters are, are not uh, use, usable. They don't stand up when we file a fair housing complaint in order to have that person's reasonable accommodation request upheld when it's denied. And it needs to come from a person who is providing treatment, services, assistance, or has a way to know about that tenant's disability and their disability-related needs. So again, I implore everyone is that the online third-party providers do not provide any support or any backup or are held up under the law and to not use your money in that uh, because ultimately it's money wasted in which we need to get a different third-party verification letter in order for such a case to be jurisdictional under the Fair Housing Act. And so please, please, please 
simply recognize that to contact us if you have questions about who you should get third party verification from, but especially with COVID-19, as we have seen a surge of people obtaining tests, we have also seen difficulty with people accessing therapy and psychiatry and the need for emotional support animals increasing because of worsened mental health symptoms during the pandemic. But make sure that in order for you to have a jurisdictional case within the Fair Housing Act, within the city or throughout Western Pennsylvania, that you obtain third party verification from a legitimate provider or treatment or services uh, in which you engage about your mental health symptoms. Uh, next one. Yeah, and, and Jam, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> Yeah, and thanks, Megan. Before before I go on to national origin, I wanted to to mention two things. The first is that um, you know Megan talked about when it's appropriate to ask for third party verification. Um, that's when it's appropriate. One of the things that I see often is that people you know hear an accommodation request and immediately go to, okay, can I get a third party verification? It, it's actually not necessary uh, to get third party verification if you or your organization feels that you can provide the accommodation and it doesn't provide a, a significant cost to you and that you could easily provide it you don't need to ask a person for documentation it's it's an option that you can that you can use but you can provide an accommodation without having documentation of a disability uh, which can save people a lot of time if there's a, an accommodation that is easily providable the other thing that uh, is good to have depending on the size of your organization is a point person who will frequently be the one to determine um, whether you can provide a reasonable accommodation. If it, someone is practicing it often, then they'll know the procedure really well. But if it's always you know, having to put together something really quickly to understand whether you can provide a reasonable accommodation, that can result in a lot of wasted time and effort from your organization and for the person you're providing the accommodation to. So it's often useful to have a point person for accommodations within an organization and for that person to receive training as, as necessary. But I'll move on to national origin. So here's a definition of national origin, but you can see that there are a few other things underneath it. So national origin is a federally protected, uh, protected class and it refers to the country or countries where a person was born or held citizenship to prior to arriving in the US. There are four that I picked out related protected classes. And these ones are protected classes in, in the city of Pittsburgh. There's place of birth, ancestry, citizenship status, and preferred language. So these are very closely related to national origin, but talk about something specific and the specific way that a person is protected. One thing I'll mention here about preferred language is the protected class is called preferred language, but um, really that, that addresses a wide range of people and how they use their language. It could be from a person who says, you know, Spanish is my first language, but if you under, if you say it to me in English, yeah, I'll get it. And the person who's saying, if, I, if I'm gonna sign a piece of paper, I need to have this in, in a language that's not English. So it's called preferred language, but really it could, it's, it's a required thing for some people to be able to access their rights. So, um, I, did you want to talk about this slide a little bit? So let me jump in and explain is that when we are looking at COVID-19, uh, it's very important to recognize xenophobia uh, and the impact that COVID-19 has had on people who are of Asian descent and who are Pacific Islanders. Uh, remember and know that the World Health Organization has strict rules regarding naming infectious diseases, uh, and that naming process is explicit that diseases are not to be named in association with any culture or population or in any way to be associated with a group of people. And so uh, COVID-19 in no way, shape, or form is related to people who are of Asian or Pacific Islander descent. Uh, and so no xenophobia whatsoever uh, is to be tolerated by housing providers. In the fact-based nature of science, uh, the virus was initially identified in China 
But COVID-19, just as we talked about perception within disability, COVID-19 is not in any way associated with people who are Chinese, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, or any people of Asian descent. And so any rules that are created because of COVID-19 must be based on facts, not stereotypes. And so as we are seeing more and more people able to be vaccinated, uh, we will see what rules are necessary for the housing space. And right now we're looking at using the common areas and that rules are equally applied to all the tenants or residents, but no rules can be based on stereotypes or perceptions. It must be based on facts and science. Uh, and certainly I know that FHP and the commission and Global Wordsmith all stand against the hate crimes and the xenophobia and the acts of hatred that we've seen recently against people of Asian descent. And absolutely in the housing space, we will do all that we can to combat it. And so if you see any discrimination, any xenophobia from a housing provider to the tenants, to the residents, uh, to please report it uh, in order for housing justice to happen. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, and I think we're also looking at the intersection here of, of two protected classes, the nationally protected national origin, and then the Pittsburgh class ancestry. Um, so interestingly, like if there were a situation, let's imagine that a person of Chinese descent uh, came to move to Pittsburgh and was looking for an apartment. And they said to the person who was gonna rent them the apartment, yeah, I just moved to Pittsburgh. Uh, and the person then denied them housing saying that they weren't comfortable uh, renting to somebody who had just immigrated to the US. Uh, that person may not be an immigrant actually to the US. They're a person of Chinese descent, that's ancestry. However, like Megan mentioned before, perceived national origin is as protected as, as a person's actual national origin. So if you are perceived to be from another country and someone discriminates against you because of it, uh, you're still protected. Thank you guys. Um, my name is Mary Jane, I'm a former interpreter translator and the founder of a local organization called Global Wordsmiths that works with um, language access advocacy. Um, and in particular, you know, talking to people about why language access is so important um, in a number of contexts, but um, in this context and with housing. Um, and I think the conversation about Title VI and about national origin is a really good segue to start talking about language access, because not only is language access um, protected under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, but there's also a lot of legal precedent and a history of case law that backs up a person's right to a language interpreter um, if you receive any federal funding at all, right? And it's not just Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, <clears throat> pardon me. There's also an executive order called EO 13166 there is a provision in the Affordable Care Act and that's section 1557. And there's also some language that has held up in case law in the past in section two of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And while um, not having a native level of English proficiency is not the same as having a physical disability, um, many of the problems of accessibility are the same. And so this is something that you want to watch out for because in a lot of ways, language access is a new field because the rate of growth for English learning or LEP, limited English proficient individuals in the United States right now is at about 80%. Um, and so really in the last five years, this has become a very visible, very tangible problem for people. And suddenly it's on everybody's radar. Um, and that is because unfortunately uh, people are starting to get sued and there are um, starting to be conversations and a narrative about language accessibility. So it should really be on your radar um, for that reason, but also because, you know, ethically, it is something that is so important to individuals with limited English proficiency. And I think it can be something for service providers that is really intimidating, right? Um, and I think, 
that's for a number of reasons. It is intimidating to work with an interpreter if you've never done it before. Um, you know, I think people are worried that it's very um, cost prohibitive, right? And also I think just people are worried they're gonna get it wrong or they misinterpret whether an interpreter is needed or they think that, you know, Google Translate is sufficient. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about all of those things today, um, but I kind of like to frame the discussion with the notion that language access is often an afterthought for service providers and even for advocates. Um, but when you think of it from the perspective of an individual with limited English proficiency, it really affects every part of their lives, right? So going to the bank, opening a bank account, understanding overdraft fees and monthly minimum balances, um, renting an apartment, understanding a lease, um, being able to report unsafe conditions or things like bed bugs or broken windows, um, being able to interact with public safety, or neighbors making appointments with doctors, going to those appointments, um, understanding diagnoses and, you know, things like instructions for prescription medication, interacting with teachers, with your children's teachers, understanding your children's report cards, being able to enroll in university as an adult with limited English proficiency, um, career services, you know, finding a job, using public transportation, the list goes on, right? Signing up for any kind of public benefit, um, being able to read and respond to mail or questionnaires. Um, so this is something that if you really think about the way it complicates a person's life, by the time they even get to you, they're already exhausted, right? And they're already used to constantly relying on other people to interpret for them or to provide in language in information for them. Um, but unfortunately, there's a big tendency for people to use untrained bilingual helpers to provide this service. And when that happens, um, a lot goes on, right? If you have a family member interpret for somebody, um, the, the, the family member may not understand the technical jargon, may not understand fully um, if you use children, I think, you know, a lot of the times children are not intellectually capable of interpreting information. Um, there's confidentiality that goes into interpretation. There's accuracy and completeness. There are best practices, right? And so a lot of the times when you think that by, you know, translating something on Google Translate or using a neighbor or a volunteer or a family member as an interpreter, it can almost cause more harm than good. And it's also a liability. So if you want to really increase your service provision and you want to become accessible and you want to operate within the best practices, um, you know, this is the webinar for you. <laughs> it's, it's not actually as complex or difficult as it seems. And part of what my job is, is to teach people that, is to explain to people that, you know, it's much better to be proactive than it is to be reactive. It's not super expensive as people may think. Um, and you make such a huge difference by taking steps to become accessible that not only are you, you know, providing equity for the people you are serving, you're also in legal compliance and you're also sort of helping to advance this narrative of accessibility, right? Which will encourage your tenants or the people you work with to reach out in the future. Um, so one of the big things that people talk to me about constantly or ask about constantly and rightfully so is the cost, right? Because I think that's one of the biggest systemic barriers to language accessibility. And when you look at something like language access at scale, indeed, it can be very expensive. Um, so if you're, you know, an independent medical provider or a small nonprofit, you know, providing interpreters for hundreds of um, limited English proficient clients every month can really start to become an expense that you need to try to fundraise for and budget for. But as a landlord or as a service provider, there are what we call vital documents that you can have translated proactively and use over 
and over and over again. And translation, um, one of the questions I get a lot is like, how much does this cost? And generally, translation can range anywhere from maybe 12 or 10 cents a word all the way up to 25 plus um, cents per word with I'd say the mean in the city of Pittsburgh being 12 to 15 cents per word. And so if you have a lease agreement that is, you know, 12 pages long and maybe 4,000 words, you know, it may cost you five or $600 to translate that. But what you're gonna save in the long run by making sure that people can understand the terms of their lease is gonna be huge. And so if you kind of try to think of it as, you know, the same way you would look at emergency healthcare versus preventative healthcare. Um, it's much less expensive to get screenings, to get mammograms than it is to treat breast cancer, right? It's the, it's the same kind of idea here. Getting these vital documents translated may be anywhere from a one to $2,000 investment. Um, if you have lots of documents, you know, insurance waivers, things like that. But for a simple lease, it should be maybe a $500 to $1,000 endeavor, depending on the length of the document. But you really only have to do once because the content, can, the variable content probably can be handled, you know, by Google Translate or something like that. And by variable content, I mean dates, um, names, you know, costs, you know, things like that. So translation itself is a lot more, you um, kind of achievable than it sounds or than it seems a lot. And then you can use those documents over and over and over again. Um, interpretation is another form of language service that you can employ, which is, you know, just like we have sign language interpreters here with us today, there are simultaneous interpreters who interpret in real time as with ASL interpreters. And then there are consecutive interpreters who do kind of stop and start again interpretation where they say a few words or and then pause to interpret and then you know there's some back and forth there. Um, generally interpreters will range anywhere from 50 to 75 dollars an hour with a two-hour minimum for foreign language interpretation that is consecutive. The cost goes up quite a bit when it is simultaneous um, because it's more demanding and usually you will have to have two interpreters so that the interpreters do not become fatigued. Um, so keep that in mind, but in most cases, a consecutive interpreter for a meeting with a tenant um, should be okay. And so you may spend, you know, 100 to $150 to have an interpreter with you at a meeting, which I know is not free, but again, when you balance that against the cost of having to replace a window or you know dealing with unsafe situations or remediation for bed bugs or you know things like that it, it really is not um, it, it's it's much less expensive to be proactive in that way um, some other forms of interpretation that you may encounter would be telephonic interpretation that's referred to in the industry as OPI which stands for over the phone interpretation. And that can range anywhere from about a dollar a minute to $2 a minute. And there are usually five minute minimums. So you can make contact with a tenant for $5 and then usually have a telephone call with a tenant um, for anywhere from, you know, five to $25, maybe $30. Um, and that can be really handy if a tenant calls you and leaves a message and you wanna call them back. Um, it's not the quality of telephonic interpretation can be very problematic. And so I do not re recommend telephonic interpretation for vital information um, because many times the interpreters who provide this service are not trained. Um, they're kind of sort of like Uber drivers where they're not paid very well and there's a very high rate of turnover. Um, so the, it, it's sort of a problematic service. But for communicating basic stuff, much, much cheaper than paying for an in-person interpreter for with, with an hour or a two-hour minimum. Um, since COVID, the use of the various video conferencing platforms to provide simultaneous interpretation has also become very popular. And the prices for that will generally be similar to the prices for in-person, um, with the difference being that for some um, video interpretation encounters, 
you would want to have a simultaneous interpreter rather than a consecutive interpreter. Um, an example would be a presentation such as this, where having to pause and wait for a consecutive interpreter to interpret would, um, you know, kind of double the length of the program and it would um, cause a delay and maybe be a little bit clunky and inelegant. So those are just some basic tips. I mean, there are, there's so much information about each of those services and there's so much we could delve into about each of these services that I could talk to you for days and days. But just keeping in mind that it's not super difficult to get a telephonic or an in-person interpreter um, there to help. It's you know definitely an expense, but it's not as unapproachable or unaffordable as I think some people think. And once you get used to working with interpreters, it's also not terribly difficult. And so I wanna talk a little bit about you know, how to make yourself accessible by using these resources. Um, and so what this basically means is how to work with interpreters, right? When to use um, written translation versus oral interpretation, right? Translation is written, interpretation is oral. They're totally separate disciplines. Um, and it is a misnomer that somebody who is good at interpretation is also good at translation, right? They're totally different skill sets. And being a good interpreter does not make you a great translator and vice versa. And being bilingual does not mean that you're prepared or qualified or good at either, right? And so again, with the training that goes into the profession of interpretation is <clears throat> substantial and significant, and this is a professional um, endeavor, right? This is a profession and the people who are interpreting have years of education and experience that they bring. Um, and it's, it's not as simple as you would think. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit first about how to work with interpreters effectively. And then I'm gonna speak to you a little bit about written translation. Um, and again, when it comes to working with interpreters, I could prepare an entire semester long course about just this subject. So this is just the very, very basics, um, but it's important. And the big one is that if you are working with an interpreter and a tenant or a subject, make sure that you look at and speak directly to the subject, not to the interpreter. Right. And that's really hard to do. Um, I think it's confusing because the instinct you will have will be to speak to the person who is speaking your language. But if you think about, you know, a doctor's appointment, um, you know, maybe there's a volunteer interpreter or a family member interpreting for a doctor or a nurse, and then the doctor and the interpreter talk to each other about the subject rather than speaking to the subject, that's really alienating right? And it does not provide equitable access and it is not a best practice, right? And so even though it feels a little bit awkward, you want to make eye contact with the subject. You want to speak directly to the subject. You want to speak in the first person, right? That means you say, hello, my name is Mary Jane. You don't say to the interpreter, tell her that I said my name is Mary Jane, right? So in a way you want to pretend that the interpreter is invisible, and a trained interpreter will help you manage that, right? And the more you do it, the less awkward it feels, the easier it gets. Um, and there are some tips that will make it flow a little bit better than I can share with you also. Um, and that would be to avoid things like acronyms, right? Like if you say um, PCHR, that won't mean anything to the subject. So you have to say Pittsburgh Commission for Human Relations, right? Um, or human resources. You have to actually say it out at least the first time you, you use a term that has an acronym, right? You can explain the acronym and then use the acronym. But keep in mind when you're using acronyms, even things that are super familiar to us, like UPMC or CMU or, you know, um, UPIT, you want to make sure that you explain those things. Um, you also want to, in, you know, kind of avoid technical jargon and industry terms. Um, you want to make sure you don't ask the interpreter questions or speak directly to the interpreter because again that's very alienating for the subject right it's not the interpreter's job to speak on on behalf of the subject 
It's just the interpreter's job to communicate and to interpret what's being said. And this is kind of a huge um, thing that I talk about in advocacy when I talk about language accessibility um, advocacy is that I think it's really easy, even for well-meaning advocates, to kind of fall into the trope of thinking that people who have limited English proficiency need to be saved. Um, but really, they just need equitable access, and they have a right to equitable access. And the interpreter's role is to help them use their voice rather than speaking on their behalf. So keep that in mind. Um, be conscious of your body language. It does help to speak more slowly and deliberately, but it does not help to speak more loudly, right? You don't wanna yell, just slow it down a little bit um, and try to use more simplified language. Not because the subject is incapable of understanding more complex language, but because it's easier and more efficient to interpret that kind of language. Um, and the last thing I wanna talk about today is translation. Um, this is another thing that I get asked about a lot. Um, in particular, I, I teach as an adjunct um, translation technology and applied translation at Carnegie Mellon University. And a lot of people come into my tech class assuming that the narrative is anti-tech and anti-machine translation because it's terrible and it's stealing jobs and it's making human translators um, kind of obsolete, but none of those things are true. Um, machine translation can be terrible and you don't wanna use machine translation for vital information, but there's a big difference between translating a very simple intake form or an invitation letter and in the example I used earlier, things like epilepsy medication for an infant, right? Machine translation would not be appropriate for the latter. But for simple communication in language pairs that are common, machine translation does a pretty good job. Um, and the reason for this is that machine translation is based on statistical data. And what that means is that all of the information that exists on the internet is crunched algorithmically and through adaptive AI and through neural machine learning to match or create matches. And the more data that exists, the more likely it is that the match will be correct. And because there is so much data out there in Google Translate and on the open internet between say Spanish and English or simplified Chinese and English or Arabic and English, those common languages have a pretty good match rate with machine translation, but Swahili to Chinese do not, right? Um, Kurundi to you know, Tagalog do not. So use it wisely and use it for non-vital information and simple communication for the common languages, that is absolutely fine. And I think, I think there's just a lot of misinformation out there about that. And I think it can be a really good tool if it's used appropriately as one tool in a broader toolbox, right? If you use machine translation appropriately, along with professional translation, along with telephonic interpretation, along with in-person interpreters, then you're going to be able to provide services in a more accessible way um, that is both legally compliant and ethically correct. So that's what I've got right now. And uh, Jim, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. And thank you so much. I forgot I was muted for a second. Uh, I'm just gonna talk uh, briefly about, you know, citizenship status protection. It's one of the protected classes that uh, came into being uh, along with preferred language last March. And it's important to know that this is here in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, it covers uh, the idea that based on a person's citizenship status, uh, they can't be denied uh, the same services as a person with a different uh, citizenship status. One way that this could show up has to do with you know, threats and harassment. If we're saying that one person is receiving a threat of a report to ICE or being harassed because of their citizenship status, not necessarily specifically because of their national origin, but because of their status as a, as a person who's come to the US. 
they are protected specifically in the city of Pittsburgh uh, for, uh, for against protect against discrimination. I wanted to say briefly about um, U visa protection. So a U visa is a visa that a person can receive if they're actively helping uh, an investigation of certain types of crimes. The commission is a U visa certifying uh, organization, but more frequently the types of crimes that you'll see that are covered under a U visa are things that you report to the police. And you know it's not a guarantee of a guarantee of being able to to stay, but it is one way that people can be protected uh, if they are experiencing some sort of crime that they can apply for this U visa for an extended uh, period of, of time to stay in the US. I do want to move on to uh, survivors of domestic violence. Uh, Megan, did you have anything to add to this slide or uh, are we ready? ready? Thanks, Jam. No, I would simply add is that we should celebrate that citizenship status uh, is a city protected class. And so recognize based on what both Mary Jane is talking about and Jam was saying, uh, is that if a landlord is saying, you don't speak English, I'm tired of trying to deal with you, and any other such direct statements, that we now have avenues in the city uh, to move forward on a housing complaint. And so citizenship status, please recognize uh, that the Fair Housing Partnership, no process of a complaint uh, involves ICE and no process of housing justice uh, involves immigration. What the struggle is, is that we cannot prevent landlords from contacting immigration. Uh, and so we will work with all individuals and social service agencies in navigating, you know, how to address such a complaint. Uh, and also keep an eye out for application requirements that require a social security number but doesn't accept an ICANN, uh, or a variety of different ways in which uh, identification is used as a proxy for citizenship and to report those cases because only if they're reported, you know, can we reach out to change that housing provider's uh, policy and behaviors. Yeah, thanks Megan. Uh, let me just move on here. Oh, I have a brief example for steering. So steering is a behavior that is illegal and it's when uh, a person is trying to encourage um, another person to, to seek out housing somewhere else. So this is an example for everyone to be able to recognize when steering might be occurring. So Sophia is a Spanish speaking woman from Peru. She's looking for a home for herself and her three children. Her realtor suggests that she look for homes in Beachview but don't look for homes in Shadyside. You're not gonna be able to read many of those store signs. This is making Sophia feel uncomfortable, not sure if it's discrimination. So this type of uh, behavior is illegal. It's called steering. And uh, here we have something on the basis of national origin, but also on the basis of the city protected class of preferred language. So anytime that you know, a housing professional is trying to move somebody from one place to another, um, if it's based on their protected class, that could be an illegal activity. So we'll get into uh, survivors of domestic violence. I think Emily, you're doing this slide? Yes. Um, so uh, survivors of domestic violence, that's a basis that I, that I mentioned earlier. It's covered by both the Fair Housing Act and the Pittsburgh City Code um, under housing. Um, and so a survivor of domestic violence is someone who has experienced violence in their home from another member of their household or person with frequent access to their home. Um, it goes right alongside intimate partner violence, but it can also um, include you know, family member violence, um, parent violence, that kind of thing, elderly, elderly violence as well. Um, it's not connected to age, it's not connected to sex. And something that we really like to note and include within this is that it can also include stalking, harassment, or other unwarranted behaviors. Um, so, you know, I, the commission's position on this is that the person who is being, um, uh, who's a victim, they're, they're victimizing the situation. It's not up to us to put the blame on them in a housing situation, if that makes sense. Um, so some fact patterns that we look at, um, specifically from landlords and other housing providers, um, not recognizing shelters as housing history, 
um, if someone has had to be displaced and has had to go to you know, a shelter for their safety or for whatever reason, um, that is a legitimate space and that is a legitimate, that's where they had to be and that's where they had to live. Um, so that is something that's always recognized, should be always recognized within housing history. Um, refusing reasonable accommodations is another thing we look at. Holding the victim responsible. Um, that's kind of what I was getting at before of the commission's position um, that the victim is not responsible for the behavior that is happening to them. Um, and so it's not up to the housing provider to put that on them. You know, it's illegal to kick someone out because an abusive spouse or partner um, is, is trying to access their, their home and where they live. Um, keeping survivors safe, confidentiality, and no documentation requirements. By that, we mean, um, you know, you cannot ask someone and we don't ask someone to provide, you know, say PFA paperwork, protection from abuse paperwork, or something similar, or restraining order, something like that. Um, no one is required to do that if they, if they file as a survivor of domestic violence with our office. Um, it doesn't have to be, there doesn't have to be official documentation or anything like that. If somebody, you know, is said that they're a victim, then that's what we consider them to be. Um, and of course, they're able to file, file under that um, with us for housing. So we can talk a little bit about the COVID-19 impact on uh, intimate partner abuse and domestic violence. So one of the things that uh, we've learned from the, the Women's Center and Shelter of, of Greater Pittsburgh, uh, who we've been talking with, is that there is an increased use of isolation as a tactic for abusers. So now with you know stay-at-home orders or the inability to, to escape the house to go into work or to go to a public place, there's an increased use of this tactic to isolate people um, by abusers. There's a limitation of movement for those experiencing violence. A lot of the time when somebody is uh, finding that pathway to escape domestic violence, it has to do with you know, getting from inside the house to somewhere outside of the house. And for a significant period of time now, people have been limited in their ability to actually leave their houses. They're, some people who are home at all times, all day with their abuser. So there was very early on in the pandemic, a decrease in reporting. People were simply unable to get to a reporting source, followed by what we see now is a spike, a huge increase in people saying, I am in a situation where I need to get out. The person who's living with me or who has access to my home, um, is a danger to my safety, to my life. So there's been a huge impact of COVID-19, not just the pandemic itself, but the orders that we have in place to keep everyone safe, is they're not keeping everyone safe equally. Um, for victims of domestic violence, that's certainly true. So some of the things that are uh, important to remember around uh, survivors of domestic violence are is trauma-informed behavior. This is something that can allow you to be more accessible to more people, particularly uh, victim of, victims of domestic violence. But when we talk about trauma-informed behavior, it actually has a beneficial effect for many people, many different uh, diverse populations that may have experienced trauma. So the first thing that I'll talk about is accommodating trauma responses. A trauma response is when a person is triggered by something that reminds them or reminds their brain of the trauma and they go into that fight, flight or freeze situation, they may not be able to fully control the actions that they take. It could look like a person for seemingly no reason at all, locking themselves in a the door, you know, running away from a situation, unleashing their emotions on a person, uh, yelling at a person or becoming catatonic, freezing, not speaking. It may seem unusual and it may seem like a like a hard thing to be able to accommodate, but understanding that those behaviors could happen at any time because each person is different and that they come from a place of trauma is important to move forward in, in the space where we can support survivors of domestic violence. Recognizing that there are cultural differences. Each culture is different, um, even for people, uh, all of us who grew up inside the US, we have different cultures. When we talk about people who came from outside of the US, the US more cultures, each culture will view um, violence and behaviors inside of a family unit differently. The important thing to prioritize is safety. So someone might call it a different word or think of it differently, but the 
key thing is to recognize when are you safe, when are you unsafe? And also recognize that individuals are different from one person to another. It might be very easy for us as one person to say, if you're in a bad situation, you should leave. But that's not the way it works for many survivors of domestic violence. It may be difficult to leave either because of something that their abuser is doing or because they're just different from us and need more time or more ability or a different ability, different resources to be able to leave that situation. One of the things that providers can do is called safety planning. And I would recommend that everybody check out the Women's Center and Shelter of Reader Pittsburgh. Uh, they may be able to help you or your organization or your client in safety planning. This is the activity of saying, okay, you recognize that at times you're unsafe. Even if it's something that only happened once, something made you unsafe. Let's put together a plan of what you could do if this happens again, if you feel like you have the ability to leave, where would you go? Who could you call? Who will take care of your children? What will happen? This type of planning allows people to, in their own way, develop something that will work for them in order to leave this situation. It's important that we understand how different each person can be and that we don't punish somebody for not leaving in the time that we think that they should. There is a protection for survivors of domestic violence. For an example, um, well, actually I'll have an example below, but on this slide, distributing resources. I have here a couple of resources from uh, the Women's Center and Shelter. They have a 24 hour hotline and a 24 hour text line and a 24 hour online chat. So there are multiple ways that somebody can communicate with, with Women's Center and Shelter if they feel like they are in a a place that they need increased safety. And distributing these resources, posting them wherever you can, kind of helps to signal the people that this could be a safe space. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a denial of housing example. This person was staying in uh, a women's shelter due to having a PFA against her previous partner. When she fills out her apartment application, she lets her, um, her, she lets her potential landlord know, um, I just came from a women's shelter. I have a PFA against my partner. I'm looking for this new start. This is going to be great. Um, the person says, okay. But weeks later, they then say, you know, I'm not comfortable renting to you because I feel like your partner poses a threat to other people. We can't hold people accountable for what another person has done to them in the past. So having a PFA against a person isn't a reason to deny someone housing. Likewise, if there's a person who has a partner who has come to their house, who has threatened them and they deny them access to the house, a landlord can't say, well, the reason that person was here and creating a threat to other people is you. Therefore, I'm gonna remove you from your house. That person is protected as a, as a survivor of domestic violence. It does not have control over what their abuser does. Therefore, they are protected and filing or attempting to remove someone for their housing because they they're a victim of domestic violence is illegal discrimination in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, I have this example here. I don't know if Megan, you wanted to add anything on the idea of a service of domestic violence. I think we're just about to go into a Q and A uh, section, but I want to, if you have anything to add on here. Thanks, Jam. Let me just add so everyone understands is that status as a survivor of domestic violence as an identity is a specific protection within the city of Pittsburgh. At FHP, we also make cases in and out of the city based on a person who is a survivor of domestic violence as we can relate it to other protected classes on an argument called impact so that women are more likely to be survivors of domestic violence or that refugees such as someone who is a Nepali refugee is more likely to be a survivor of domestic violence. And so we make these cases in and out of the city, but having the city protected class is fantastic. And cases that we have handled uh, relate to a survivor who needs to flee the unit and to terminate their lease. And 
And then from that, we've also addressed the need that a housing provider would bifurcate case or separates a lease where the survivor is able to stay on the lease, but the abuser is evicted. And so there are a few different ways that domestic violence intersects with fair housing. Uh, and also please recognize are what happens at the government level, which are nuisance ordinances. In Northtown, Pennsylvania, a few years ago, there was a nuisance ordinance or what's called a crime-free ordinance when a government or the municipality can decide if a landlord needs to evict the tenant because there was called a nuisance that's defined by the municipality. A woman who was being abused by her ex-boyfriend who kept returning to the unit at no invitation from her was scared to call the police because she was threatened with eviction if she reached out to the police more than three times during a certain time period, such as four months or a year. At one point, when he was actively beating her, she refused to call the police and a neighbor called the police on her behalf. She was airlifted to the hospital and at the hospital threatened with eviction because the police had come to her unit. And so as a result, there is a requirement in Pennsylvania that no nuisance ordinance is used against a survivor of domestic violence for accessing the police because of the abuse. However, this legislation is reactive, not proactive. And so please be aware and report it. If you have a client who is being threatened, not necessarily by the tenant, but by the municipality or the borough for eviction because that person as a survivor of domestic violence is contacting the police due to the abuse that occurs at the unit. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Megan. Wow, that sounds horrifying. And <laughs> I'm glad that in our city we have that protection uh, for survivors of domestic violence. There was an interesting, since we're uh, moving into the Q&A, there was an interesting uh, question in the chat about a person who was able to terminate their lease early due to a, a domestic violence situation. And they asked, is it illegal for the landlord to require the tenant to pay rent for the month that they were in the shelter? So this is an interesting one. And earlier, Emily mentioned reasonable accommodations for uh, vic survivors of domestic violence. A reasonable accommodation for a survivor of domestic violence could be something like changing the person's unit so that their um, so that their partner doesn't know where they live, or something like being able to end their lease early. Um, if it is reasonable to do so, if the landlord can find another tenant um, easily, then that could be a reasonable accommodation. So I would certainly encourage people to to let their let their clients know, let people that they support know that. There are reasonable accommodations that if the if their client were to say to their landlord, I am in a domestic violence situation, I need to leave, to a degree the landlord needs to work with the tenant to find a way for them to be supported. Now, is it illegal for the landlord to require the tenant to pay rent for the month they were in the shelter? I would say waiving the rent for the for that month would be a reasonable accommodation. So I wouldn't say that it's illegal for the landlord to, to charge rent, but I would say asking the person to waive the rent for the time the person was in the shelter could be considered a reasonable accommodation that the landlord would, would want to look at and enter into a process to determine what can we do. Um, I'm interested, Megan, if you have a, a take on that one. Right, let me intercede and, and explain is that when we're looking at a cost associated based on the request due to a protected class, then we have to look at the capacity of the landlord themselves. And also start to separate out the intersectional moments that are happening. So a reasonable accommodation is based on a disability. And so absolutely survivors of domestic violence uh, can have post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, depression, anxiety, and other diagnoses that can qualify as a disability for a reasonable accommodation request regarding the need to flee and remove uh, themselves from that unit. And in that, remember we talked about the interactive process previously, 
And so it's based on the capacity of the landlord about how to engage in that conversation. So what I mean is, does the landlord have other properties that are safe for the tenant to transfer to? That's one consideration. When we're considering that the tenant needs to flee that landlord contract entirely, then we need to look at the finances of that landlord. I've had landlords who rent the unit above their garage and who literally use the monthly rent payment as part of their mortgage payment. And so if that is the case regarding the financial and administrative burden, and that is a legitimate burden for a landlord, then the request can't be made uh, compared to a large company uh, that is able to waive one month's rent without fundamentally impacting their capacity to operate as a business based on their finances. And so with this specific question, I would also uh, look to get some more details in understanding with that one month that we're discussing, uh, whether or not there was another tenant uh, who is living in the unit and paying rent for that time, how much notice the landlord had. And what we often do in this type of situation uh, is that as long as there's a security deposit, that we will waive the security deposit for the immediate month following a survivor fleeing the unit uh, to cover that initial month rent for the landlord to then secure another tenant uh, in order to rent the property. And just one add-on point is to, if you are providing uh, services to clients who are accessing federal housing, all the topics that we discussed today, um, from disability access to uh, language access to domestic violence access, uh, have additional obligations to recipients of uh, housing providers who receive federal dollars. Uh, and so please certainly report and ask us questions regarding uh, providers who receive federal money as there are added burdens to their responsibility uh, for making sure that the properties address these needs that have been made even worse during COVID. Yeah, thanks, Megan. It's interesting, you know, so reasonable accommodation can be defined in a lot of ways, but as Megan was saying, it has to be reasonable. Um, this is, This is why, give me one sec. <laughs> this is why it's important to uh, consider which, um, what, what the landlords, sorry, we're having an interpreter error. <laughs> Bill, your camera's off and you're spotlighted. Would you like to interpret or would you like me to continue? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's important to determine what what the landlord's capability is to address the the accommodation. If a person you know simply can't address the accommodation because of the cost burden or the number of units that they that they rent, that's acceptable. But it's important to enter that process, as, as Megan said, the interactive process to consider what can we do to support somebody. So yeah, open to any other questions. Please feel free to put them in the, the Q&A, put them in the chat. We'll try to keep an eye on them. Uh, to address one of the questions, you know, not necessarily directly related to, uh, to what we're talking about today, but somebody did ask in the Q&A, is it legal for landlords to charge late fees during the pandemic? So that's a question um, that is a little bit complicated, you know, because we have two different, in the city of Pittsburgh, we have two laws operating on us. We have the, the CDC's ev eviction moratorium, and then we have the city of Pittsburgh's. Uh, as far as late fees go, somebody can certainly charge late fees, but then the question is, you know, what to do about those late fees. And then it becomes a question of, you know, a notice to quit or an eviction, is that permissible? I'd say, look at your local law um, and, and review the CDC moratorium for yourself and make that decision um, as you think that it's appropriate. Um, they asked, is someone permitted to kick someone else out if they sell the property during the active time of the lease? Yeah, I would say everything is, is case by case. So it's important to review with 
uh, with potentially you know, your, your advocate, uh, what, what the exact situation is and whether or not uh, someone is or isn't protected by either of the uh, eviction moratoriums that are, that are happening. So I think uh, we'll ask a, a question. Um, here's a question for for Mary Jane. So, in terms of uh, getting an interpreter or a, a translation, what do you think is a, a reasonable timeline for someone to start thinking about? Do I need to get an interpreter for something, and do I need to um, have this translated? If I need it by this date, when should I really start start thinking about having it translated? a really good question um, and the answer is that you know most service providers if you submit something last minute will be able to turn around a translation for you quickly but you may pay some rush fees on that and in general um, you know I would say for like a typical one to five thousand word document about two weeks um, for one to 2000 word document, maybe one week. Um, and just in general, the longer it is and the more um, design work there is in the file, right? So if it's a brochure that might be like an AI file or an InDesign file um, that requires some graphics design, you know, you wanna tack some more, on time, some more time onto that too. Um, for interpreters, if you're doing simultaneous interpretations, such as for an event like this, um, you want to make sure you schedule at least two weeks out so that your interpreters will have time to study the material ahead of the assignments. Um, this is especially true, um, you know, we had the uh, American Federation of Teachers uh, request some simultaneous interpretation for us for their national convention, which is like a huge, big thing. Um, and there were, you know, lots and lots of sessions with different speakers, and there were a lot of really high profile speakers like Nancy Pelosi, and it was super exciting, but the interpreters wanted to make sure they got it right, right? And so for something like that, you want to begin preparing well in advance. Um, for like a phone call, responding to somebody's uh, voice message, for example, or just returning a call, you can usually um, use a service uh, that has telephonic 24 seven interpretation, for example, and there's no pre-scheduling required. Um, if you would like to have a video or in-person interpreter, I generally say about a week notice is good for a consecutive interpretation. Um, so just use, you know, use, I don't wanna say common sense because I wouldn't expect people to know this. Um, you know, we're all learning about this together. But just think in terms of how much time will the interpreters need to prepare and for, for oral interpretation and how complex is this document in terms of graphics, word count, and technical content for written translation. The more complex, uh, the more time you'll need. You know, the more um, kind of high stakes the interpretation session is, the more time you'll need. And, you know, all sessions are high stakes and everybody deserves to have um, you know, professional interpretation. Um, so that's not to say you should be flippant about scheduling um, consecutive interpreters, but it's usually easier to get an interpreter on site um, that will be consecutive, you know, with a week or less notice. And um, also with interpreters, sometimes people will charge um, a little bit more if it's last minute um, or after hours, right? On weekends, if there's an emergency after 5 p.m. So you should be prepared for that as well. Thanks, Mary Jane. Mm -hmm. We have a, this is a really good question in the chat. The question is, I work in the addictions field. What are the FHA discrimination guidelines for someone with a history of chemical dis dependency issues? I think there's a lot inside that question. Um, I feel like Megan is going to give a better answer than I can. So I'll give a, a brief one. Um, this is flagging to me that it is in the realm of disability when we're talking about medical history, uh, it's not legal to use a person's medical history to make decisions about their housing. Uh, but there's a lot wrapped up in this question, including, you know, how do they know that a person has a chemical dependency? 
is there an active addiction um, taking place? And um, is there a, also a criminal background? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Megan. Absolutely. Uh, so like Jan said, it's nuanced, but to understand that substance abuse is a protected class within disability. And what's protected is recovery. And so a person who is in recovery, who is not actively abusing substances is protected within the act. And what that typically means is that if a person has a criminal history that is related back to their previous substance abuse, and so disorderly conduct, public drunkenness, shoplifting, prostitution, uh, a variety of reasons for why a person has criminal charges, but not simply charges, but guilty pleas or convictions to those charges. And it's related to the behavior of who they are when they were using. Because we understand that when we're in recovery, who we are in recovery is not who we are when we were using. Those are two different people. And so when a person is denied housing because of a criminal history that relates back to their previous substance abuse, we can do a reasonable accommodation in which what we do is we use it as a scale. So we show their criminal history and then we show their status as a person in recovery, how we know that they're clean, their completion of a program, Maybe they're counseling youth or people who are striving to be in recovery, how they're involved in their community, character references, a reference from their landlord. And we balance out the scale of their criminal history with the scale of who they are in recovery. And that because in recovery, we don't expect any of those behaviors to occur while they are housed. That, that's what a landlord wants to know. Will this person commit criminal acts in my housing? And we are saying no, and here is the proof, because a person in recovery is not the person they were when they were using uh, or misusing substances. I will say that there are carve outs related to five specific uh, criminal acts, and those criminal acts cannot be uh, reasonably accommodated because of the severity of those acts. Uh, those are homicides, uh, crimes of a sexual nature, crimes against children, uh, arson, uh, if a person accidentally or on purpose burned down their last apartment, you can't reasonably assume uh, for a landlord to take on the risk of that reoccurring, uh, as well as there is a specific carve out for men. Uh, anyone who has watched Breaking Bad, you will recognize that meth users uh, are often meth makers. And meth has a propensity to explode when you make it. And so it's been considered not reasonable for a landlord to take on the risk of a previous meth user potentially uh, relapsing, making meth, and that causing an explosion in the unit. Uh, and so definitely reach out for assistance with reasonable accommodations. Uh, regarding a criminal history and substance abuse uh, and its relationship. Additionally, we can do accommodations related to criminal histories for mental health diagnosis, uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, uh, and any diagnosis in which the diagnosis was not treated at the time of the criminal offense. And now that the person's in treatment, there's no expectations of a reoccurrence of those criminal activities. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, that's really good information. There's, um, while we're on the topic of, of criminal history and criminal background, so it's not yet a protected class federally or at the city of Pittsburgh, but HUD has some very specific guidance about how you can and can't use or how landlords can and can't use criminal history. Um, so some of the things Megan touched on before is uh, she said, you know, charges, convictions. Arrest history is something that you can't use as a determiner of a person's uh, future behavior because it doesn't necessarily determine a person's past behavior. An arrest is just an arrest. It's not a conviction, it's not a charge. So using a person's arrest history, um, it shouldn't happen. Uh, on 
And the reason that HUD has created these specific guidelines for criminal history is that there's a disparate impact. We know that people um, of color are more likely to have a criminal history, particularly if we're looking at arrest history. We know that people of color are more likely to be arrested whether or not it's something that they actually did. So that's why, you know, HUD has released guidance to tell us looking at a person's arrest history is not an accurate determiner of their future behavior. They are very specific in, in the way that they would like landlords and housing providers to look at criminal history. Weighing in, as Megan said, what has happened since this history? Is it history that's from a year ago? Is it history from 10 years ago? Housing providers are encouraged um, and could at times, if someone brought a complaint, be required to really consider how they're using the criminal history or criminal background to deny or allow people housing because it will have a disparate impact on people of color. Um, one thing I think might be useful is if we talk a little bit more about the idea of disparate impact. I don't know, Megan, if you uh, wanted to talk about it a little bit, and then we can answer this question that's in the chat. Absolutely. So to understand what Jan just referenced uh, is to recognize that there's two legal theories under housing discrimination. That's treatment, which is a direct action. I won't rent to you. And there's impact, which is a neutral rule or policy that disproportionately impacts a group of people. And when we're talking about criminal history, what the executive order says is that we see the data that our criminal justice system arrests and convicts people of color at a much higher rate than white people for the exact same offenses. Therefore, using a criminal history as the basis in which a tenant will be denied or accepted into housing is racist, is the argument. And so this discussion is still ongoing regarding being able to implement it, but we have seen good litigation happening. Home of Virginia in the past couple of years settled litigation on these facts in which they created a best practices process that we can provide if you have sympathetic landlords who are willing to look at it as a way to reconsider how to address criminal history in the tenant application, to understand the person and not simply the numbers that are producing that criminal history because those numbers are skewed by a racist system. And then again, if the housing provider is receiving federal funding, how criminal history uh, is used in the tenant application process and a grievance hearing process is required uh, in, order to, in order to show who the person is as a human being besides what comes up on paper with the criminal history. Uh, so there's a multitude of ways that we're working to address it and to keep reporting instances uh, if you think criminal history is being used illegally uh, to deny one of your clients. Yeah, thanks so much. I know we're almost, we're just about at the end of our time. I wanted to make sure we answer this question though, because I think it's a, a really good question. This is a little bit more for Mary Jane. Somebody says that they work for a nonprofit that works with mostly immigrants and they often depend on them as their service provider to uh, interpret. How can this person convince them the, to purchase services and not rely on them? Um, I think I know the answer to this question, um, but Mary Jane, I'll let you answer. Sure, I just wanna make sure I understand the question, right? Um, you're saying that because we do, uh, we have a program called the Language Access Project where we uh, basically provide free translation and interpretation services as well as um, training and capacity building for selected nonprofits. Um, and I think that's one of the things we're really well known for. Uh, we've, we've provided, I think, 
uh, close to 9,000 hours of um, no cost language services to like 20 nonprofits in the area over the last couple of years. And it's great, but also the way we do that is um, by using our profit. So we do need to also sell services sometimes um, in order yeah. to, you know, keep keep the company afloat. So are you talking about that jam? Like, how can we? I wasn't talking about that. That's really great to know. Oh. I was actually <laughs> thinking, no, no, that's a, a great answer. What I was thinking of is, in fact, the the responsibility for getting an interpreter is not on the person who needs interpretation. So this oh. person had asked, how can I convince, I think they mean, how can I convince the clients of the organization to purchase services and not rely on me as an interpreter? In fact, um, it's really the organization that should be getting the interpreter. It's really great that that Global Wordsmith has that program that nonprofits can use, but um, especially for you know a larger company or you know a for-profit uh, organization, you're expected to, to provide the interpreter, not the person who needs the interpretation. Yes. The, so the onus should never be on the tenant. Um, the onus should never be on, um, you know, the advocate or the volunteer. The onus is always on the service provider or the landlord um, to, you know, provide the interpreter because they are the federally covered entity, right? They are the entity that's receiving federal funding. They are the entity that is required by law to do it. And also they're the one who are, who are ethically responsible for the provision of interpreter services, right? Um, yeah. You know, again, I like to be careful comparing the deaf community with the English learning community because it's not the same thing, but the set of problems and the set of needs are similar. And can you imagine going to a hospital and demanding that a member of the deaf community provide his or her own interpreter? Or can you imagine, you know, going to a school and, um, you know, expecting somebody who is in a wheelchair to provide his or her own accessibility ramp, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's simply not, you know, we have to start thinking of language access as, you know, the legal mandate and as the narrative that it deserves to be and that it is, and it, it, you know, it is a civil right. Um, and until we start, you know, thinking about it in this way and advancing that narrative, people are going to get left behind and be in dangerous situations and be in danger of indigence. And um, so, you know, from both an ethical and a legal standpoint, um, those are some some arguments that you can use and what I would what I would sort of knee jerk say as my <laughs> response. Yeah, and the person clarified that they were talking about the providers and the landlords. And I think that's a great way to convince somebody of saying, you know, this is a legal right and you're you have an obligation this is much cheaper as you said earlier on this end than on the other end where it's a lawsuit or a misunderstood lease or um an interpersonal problem it's much cheaper at this end than on the other end um i don't know if there are local laws for this when i lived in mass there was a local law that related specifically to asl interpreters and if um if somebody were to say uh, no, we don't provide the interpreter, you provide the interpreter, there was actually a penalty for that organization having done that. So it's important, it's important to remember that it's so much cheaper to, to try to provide the access than to go from the other end to deny somebody and then wind up with this, you know, huge, huge risk. And Jam, let me just jump in and, and say is that to all social service agencies that work with immigrant and other populations with limited English proficiency. You have my heartfelt gratitude because Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania are terribly behind uh, national norms and trends on providing translation and interpreting. Uh, Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania is struggling to catch up with modern technology and modern expectations. And the law and requirements are nuanced and complex regarding enforcement. Uh, so I absolutely support you and that we should not be relying on social service agencies to provide all forms of interpretation at all times. Uh, and we are trying to make that change uh, throughout the city. So thank you for your work. Uh, and, and we do, I do agree that we need to change the norm in that landlords and housing providers and many other service, service providers uh, need to be able to provide their own direct language translation and interpretation services.
Yeah. Thanks so much, Megan. I think we're just about at the end of our time. I don't want to keep anyone, but thank you so much to, to Megan from FHP and Mary Jane from Global Wordsmiths. It's been really great talking together and, and uh, answering these questions. Uh, feel free, you know, this, um, we have a Facebook event and a video for this, uh, for this video. So if you come up with some other questions, feel free to post them on the Facebook and um, Here's our contact information. I think I have my screen shared. If you have questions for myself or for FHP or for Global Wordsmiths, never, never worry about, you know, we're too busy to, to ask questions. That's what we do. We love to ask questions. That's how we prevent misunderstandings and how we make sure people have access to their rights. So, you know, once again, thank you um, to the panelists. Thank you everyone who uh, came and uh, I think we'll uh, close it out. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Fair Housing Month. Yes. <laughs>